taking a step back, we have to just remind ourselves that we're not comparing apples and apples here. Um, I think that Bitcoin clearly has become this trusted store of value and the comparisons that are made with gold and look at what happened to the gold standard in the 70s, just look at the charts, very, very interestingly similar. However, Bitcoin and some of these other altcoins, in including ours, do very different things. They, they serve different purposes. <laughs> Dear crypto community and blockchain buddies across the globe, welcome back to season two of Kryptonites, the no BS blockchain channel built with the community for the community. And today we have another timeless interview with an amazing guest, the CEO of Tan Shuen and the co-founder of Zilliqa, Max Cantilia. Max, it's a pleasure to have you, my friend. It's really good to be here, <laughs> Alex. Yeah. It's good to have you. How does it feel going from Singapore to London? Are, do you feel a bit cold tonight? Are you all right? No, we have this, <laughs> we have this lovely fireplace here. I'm okay. Actually, I much prefer this, this temperature and climate. 33 degrees and 100% humidity is very, very uncomfortable. So, so I'm okay. But in, in another three months' time, I'll probably be saying something very different. <laughs> Well, welcome back to London. Thank and you. You're back, Thank you. Back. Welcome back home, I guess. Thank you. Good to be back. Good to be back. <laughs> so, um, Max, you have accomplished many, many things. Obviously, Zilliqa, I think, is one of the most exciting projects out there. Um, but as we were talking about a little bit earlier, you said community projects have both highs sure. and lows as well. And uh, yes. I think a lot of people who envision a co-founder or CEO, they think, oh, that's so cool, but don't realize how difficult it truly is. Yeah. If you don't mind sharing a little bit about your experience so far and yes, with the yes, community. of course. Um, on on that point, Alex, you know the fact that these projects are community driven is is a huge asset. But at the same time, if you're on the project side, um, there are terrific highs and tremendous lows too. Uh, you know. Some of some of our team, myself included, have had death threats, um, all sorts of nasty, you know, nasty things going on. And and those, you know, those moments do make you feel pretty low. Um, but at the same time, uh, we also have some incredibly positive energy on our project in the in the community. And um, we we have, I think, an increasingly loyal following of people who don't think like minute, <clears throat> minute by minute or hour by hour traders. Rather, they think about the long term. They think like investors. And that's a world that I'm quite familiar with. And so, um, yeah, it's 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 not easy managing that tension. And um, you know, especially with the extended team, some of whom have never been through anything like this before. And, and, and that's a challenge, you know, as a, as a leader, of course, that's a challenge. But um, we have to look to, to the future and we have to think a little bit more long term. Um, I always urge our community members to collaborate with us. If they've got criticisms to make, that's, that's perfect. We need that. But but make the criticism constructive and not destructive. You know, that's how we collaborate and build something together. There's one thing there's, you told me about earlier as well, which is some people tend to criticize not only projects, but the blockchain itself by saying that the blockchain is just a lousy database, like an Excel <laughs> table that is immutable. Um, how, how do you tend to respond to the people who do not believe in the blockchain in general? Okay. so. First of all, I think it's really unfair to, to compare blockchain to a standard database because they are two entirely different things. Um, you know, a blockchain offers two particular characteristics that a standard database just does not. So firstly, of course, we talk about immutability and, and that is an essential property for, for a blockchain. Um, and um, that's that's not something that can be achieved very easily with with a you know with a with a standard database. The second thing, of course, is consensus. You know, achieving consensus in a decentralized fashion 
with a standard database technology, it, it's, it's not possible to achieve that. So when we, when we think about those properties, then I have to say that we're not really comparing apples with apples. Um, however, having said all of that, um, over the last uh, three or four years of having been involved in the blockchain world, I can tell you that we have seen hundreds and hundreds of projects um, that really don't need a blockchain. Mm. So it's very frustrating when large corporations especially come and see you with a use case where they actually just need a simple database and not a blockchain. Mm. And um, so I think the hype bubble has definitely, it's, it's died down but we still see too many people wanting to build something using a blockchain when they don't really need one. And usually that's because it's good for PR, it makes you look fashionable amongst your competitors. Um, but uh, but, but that, that's, that's the other side to your, to your question. That's a fascinating answer. And I think in one of our previous interviews with Andreas Antonopoulos, he gets really upset when you have private blockchains because he says the whole point of it is to be open source and neutral and he has criteria in that sense, but what is your criteria as to really know or understand if I need blockchain or not? Are there a few things that are really important to you? The, the basic thesis, Alex, is could you do that thing? Could you achieve that use case without blockchain? You know, and, and it's as simple as that. So for the last four years, when people have been coming to us and talking to us about potential use cases, we ask that very basic question. Um, if you think you need a, 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 a blockchain, um, why is that? And could you actually achieve what you need to with this use case without using one? And if the answer is absolutely not, then we have a good use case. So, so it's fundamental, it's really quite fundamental. Mm, that's a really good question to ask. Just say, could you do that without the blockchain? And if you could, then the, the options are limited. That's a really good question to ask. Um, in terms of, you just talked about consensus earlier. And as you know, proof of work and proof of stake are two massive topics. Yes. Ethereum 2.0, et cetera, et cetera. What is your overall stance in terms of consensus and the different systems that we have as of today? I think that um, we have proof that proof of work works. It's a really awkward sentence there. <laughs> but, but we we know that it works um i think that from what i've seen so far anyway i think that proof of stake is still very much at the theoretical stage at this point in time and i really haven't seen too much evidence that that current protocols can can make that work as successfully as proof, proof of work can um, and certainly so at Zilliqa, we've thought uh, long and hard about, about this question because, you know, our scientists are not wedded to one, um, one particular uh, type of protocol or another. We, but, but we've chosen to use proof of work in a, in a particular way um, to achieve the, the results that we wanted to. But I think proof of stake is really interesting. I, I, I just think it's... Um, it's not practical at this point in time. That's really interesting. And obviously you understand this space really, really well. In terms of consensus and nodes, do you mind imagining if my grandma Susie was here with us and she really was curious about nodes? That's really funny. I don't think she'd be curious about that. But uh, if you had to explain to her what are nodes and, and why consensus in terms of uh, validation in the blockchain is so critical in this space. I think, I think firstly, um, when people use the word node, it's not a word that's particularly meaningful. It doesn't conjure up any particular image, not, not for me anyway. So I, I tend to ex explain to people that a node is simply a computer. A computer and especially yeah. if I'm speaking to, <laughs> you know, to, to, to your grandmother, my grandmother isn't around anymore, um, then I would simply explain that, that a node is a computer, a computer yeah. and a blockchain is actually a network of computers. And oh, nice to enabling, um, enabling us to transfer something of value from, let's say, my computer to your computer without having somebody centralized 
uh, making that happen is is really what the blockchain is essentially about you know it's it's about being able to transfer value from one node or one computer to another uh, without there being some central policeman um, making all of that happen and, and navigating traffic in between mm, that's a beautiful explanation super simple i'm sure Susie. try it out <laughs> I'll test, I'll call her later. <laughs> Grandma Susie, I got the explanation. Uh, and so in terms of uh, the actual blockchain, so you guys are trying to solve one of the most, I would say, criticized problems in this space, which is scalability. Yes. And uh, many people have many different angles on what scalability itself means. But um, how would you respond to someone who says, yeah, but your blockchain is not scalable and never work? What, what, what would your type of response be in that sense? Well, firstly, you know, we launched our mainnet in January of this year, and we have achieved uh, high throughput through the use of uh, this technique called sharding. So firstly, we have made this work. Maybe there's a different question here, which is, do we need scalability? If we research the, the, the throughput rates that are required on any major blockchain platform today, it's arguable that we need thousands and thousands of transactions per second at this point in time. However, when we designed Zilliqa at the outset, that wasn't the overarching um, uh, objective. For, for me, and forgive the car analogy, I know I'm full of them, but for me, it's a case of building a highway where we alleviate traffic jams. So it's not just about being able to drive your car super fast, it's actually about alleviating the traffic jam. And of course, if I extend the analogy into, into, into real practice, we've seen that there are, you know, there are, there are major chains that experience log jams when traffic increases sub substantially and the price to then use that highway becomes inordinately high. So when we designed Zilliqa, we wanted to minimize traffic jams and we wanted to keep the economics of using the platform very, very low. And I'm very proud to say we have achieved that. Uh, yes, of course, over the next few years, we want more and more adoption and we want to really prove that point. But, but those are the overarching objectives that, that we had in mind. That is really well explained. I think the highway is one of the easiest analogies, right, to really explain what is necessary. Not in, I remember Andreas saying something like scalability is, is an ongoing process. It's not yes. a result. Yes. It's exactly. not a one-time exactly. milestone. Like even right now, if I want to send you a 4K video of Kryptonites through email, it's not going to work. I'm going to need a Google Drive and still that's going to take a lot of time. But Exactly. Um, based on what you said about the mainnet, um, you know, there's some projects that say we were able to reach X amount of transactions per second on our test net. Um, they'll say, oh, we, we're faster than anyone, but they haven't launched a mainnet yet. Um, what is your response to that, those type of people saying, look at how many transactions we can do on our test net versus mainnet? Well, I think, I think again, being brutally simplistic about it, a test net is a, a rather special environment that that of course doesn't really mimic the, the the real world and therefore if you can if you can achieve very high transaction throughput on a test net i th i think that in itself is an achievement by the way um, but of course then we have to ask ourselves whether that throughput has been achieved on chain or off chain okay that's that's very important um, but I think anybody that can make an achievement, uh, I, I, I take my hat, hat off to. But I think it is a very different matter going to mainnet. When you go to mainnet and, and, and suddenly the, the circumstances are different and, and real and sometimes unpredictable, can we maintain that level of throughput when, when we become truly public? That, that I think is a whole different question. And uh, so I, I, would, I would sort of answer your question with that question. Yeah, that's a great question. And your analogy of the highway really reminds me of how a test set is more like having being on a 
desert road in the middle of Nevada with no cars, no yep. traffic uh, signals, and just going full blast, you know, full speed with yes. <laughs> your motorcycle or car. So yeah. So another thing that people are concerned about, obviously scalability, you answered that extremely well. Uh, when it comes to adoption and they, they basically, they look at the different dApps that are available and a few of them are getting a little bit of transaction, 20,000, 30,000 people a day. And everyone's like, oh, but that's not enough. Uh, what is your overall perspective on dApps as of today? What would be a killer dApp, for example, that could finally get more people to adopt or sure. any angles? Yeah, sure. So at at the dApp level, we, we're we're very serious about hunting for new and, and creative entrepreneurs. So Zilliqa has set aside a multi-million dollar grants program to, to help to find those sorts of, of really interesting dApps. And I can tell you one that, that has, has blown us away already is a company called Unstoppable Domains. So take a look at them. It's a team based in San Francisco that have, have used Zilliqa to build a very, very interesting uh, blockchain domain business. And go and take a look at it because what they've done is, is, is super cool. Tim Draper's just, just put $4 million into oh, it as a wow. follow on. And um, so I'm excited about finding young entrepreneurs, that need to be young, uh, <laughs> entrepreneurs who have really interesting new ideas, new and creative ideas. How do you feel about the gaming industry? Um, as you know, Companies like Rockstar with uh, Grand Theft Auto, they, they've generated more revenue than the most profitable movies in the business, more than Avatar, more than yeah. Harry Potter, um, yes. the one video game. So a lot of people don't realize how big the video game space is. Do you, would you see that as a successful milestone if one of these guys, Rockstar, Konami, Capcom, or approached you and wanted to build uh, a video game dApp on? I, I do find it um, sometimes it's a lot when people talk about blockchain gaming because it's, it's not as though this is a, a whole new industry in itself. Yeah. It's, it's gaming, but supported by the things that blockchain, um, you know, I, I think can bring to it. So of course, you know, that, that could be traceability, the immutability um, uh, factors, uh, as, as well as I think some really creative thinking that's now going on about how different games that are based on different blockchains can interoperate through the use of uh, these, these accessories that can be used across games, for example. Um, I think, however, for me, the, the, the key thing here is that we've got to maintain the economics. If it's not economical, as we've seen with things like Ethereum, on, who um, uh, you know, actually ended up building on Zilliqa, um, then actually if it becomes too expensive to play, then guess what? Your, your usage is suddenly going to drop, um, you know, dramatically. So, so maintaining, I think, the, the sort of, um, you know, this, this transparency, this traceability, uh, you know, the secondary market is huge. I, know, I never knew it until, until last year. It's enormous. Um, blockchain again can can do that in a way that that I don't think any other technology can. Um, but then again, uh, offering the opportunity to interoperate um, accessories across games, I th I think really 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 exciting. So and that is. Um, but my you know my my team tells me that that it's still blockchain gaming is still a tiny tiny proportion of the the industry as a whole. So there's a there's a long way to go yet, but I think it's a, I think it's a great application, good it, good use case. It would be great if one of those companies decide to approach you know one of the scalable blockchains. Sure. And as you know, these days, like altcoins and utility tokens are taking a lot of heat, and a lot of people are saying you know Bitcoin is the only one, the winner takes all type thing, and yeah. believe that utility tokens don't have real value or bad token economics. How how do you respond to this type of reaction from the community? I, I think that, that um, you know, is that a, I was speaking at, a, at an event just this weekend where there were a lot of yeah, maximalists. I yeah. And um, I have to say that, that taking a step back, we, we have to just remind ourselves that this is not apples and apples. 
Bitcoin and some of these other altcoins, in including ours, do very different things. They, they serve different purposes. And again, if we're going to build um, business logic into blockchain applications, then we need altcoins that um, you know, do allow you, for example, to build smart contracts. So I think that, that we're talking, we're not talking apples and apples here, if I'm being, if I'm being fair. Um, do, I, do I think in, in the next 30 years that, that there will be space for tens of thousands of different coins? No, no. <laughs> of, 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 course of course not. not yeah. But I would say that trying to compare, trying to compare Bitcoin to an altcoin and asking if one or the other is, is going to win is a bit like comparing gold, a chunk of gold um, as, a, as, as a commodity with a future or option, yeah. right? It's, yeah. it's, you're, you're not comparing like yeah, with like. Absolutely. I think that's a really good way to put it because if Bitcoin was your personal bank account, you still need financial services. The entire banking industry is not just a bank account or the financial industry is not just a bank account. So yeah. it makes a lot of sense to say, hey, these are apples, these are oranges. Uh, so would it be better to look at it as asset classes? So let's say if I, I wanted to invest in crypto, I want to invest in blockchain protocols like Zilliqa or other, other prototocols that I like, and then this is the asset class for exchanges. They might be the New York Stock Exchange of exactly. crypto. Is that exactly. a more rational way of looking I at think it? That's, uh, I think that's the exact way that, that uh, an investor or a, or a trader perhaps um, should look at these things. They're, they're different asset classes. Different asset classes. I'm glad to hear that. It makes a lot of sense to me. Um, in terms of the future of the blockchain protocols or how you see things happening by next year or two years and three years, obviously you're a visionary. You had a great vision with Zilliqa. Yeah. Like, what do you think will unfold in front of us in, by the end of this year, next year? Obviously, you don't have a crystal ball. Uh, I think, <laughs> or at least hope. Yeah. I think there are a few things here, Alex. Um, number one, I think that that we we have to optimize. You know, certainly, certainly, if I if 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 you um, if you would think of it as Zilliqa version two point zero, optimizing the the throughput mechanism, optimizing the way our smart contract functionality works, um, essential. I think that's the same for all these platforms. By the way, Op optimization. Number two, I think the customer experience is dreadful. I, I, think, I, I think I speak on behalf of all platforms. These platforms are very, very awkward for developers to use. So I think streamlining the developer experience, um, making things like testing much, much more user-friendly and easier are critical if we're going to build important applications and be able to, to, to test them. Um, Thirdly, again, a really practical point is oracles, um, IoT. You know, we need to see significant improvement in, in these things so that we can actually make the blockchain technology much more usable for real life applications. Yeah, it's, um, it's absolutely essential that we, we, we do that. Max Cantilia, it's been an absolute honor to have you on the show uh, and your ability to frame things so simply. I'm sure it's going to be very useless and making this hopefully a timeless interview. Hopefully in 10 years from now, people will still want to watch and learn uh, all the wisdom you've shared. If we want to follow you or contact you or connect with you, which platform are you the most active on these days? I, I would say probably Twitter. Twitter. Yep. Okay, great. And um, yeah, so please let us know the progress. You're in London now, you're back home. Absolutely. So uh, please connect and we hope to see you in future seasons. Uh, thank you so much Alex, for coming tonight. Real pleasure. <laughs> really enjoyed it. It was an absolute pleasure. And guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Don't forget to like, comment. If you have any questions for Max Cantelia from Zilliqa, we'll try to answer them as soon as possible. And don't forget to blast that bell notification so you get access to all these timeless interviews. We will be back next Wednesday at 8 o'clock UK time, premiering at a PC near you. See you next week, guys.